Did he, are you the you know? I am the Okay. Oh. Well, I'm opening the sutra. You don't need to, you can just chant it. June was on fire yesterday. When she gets like that, I give her a wide berth. <laughs> so, since we, uh, since I talked about a case with Master, Zen Master Yuman the other day, I'm going to do another one with Yuman. This is case 87. <clears throat> Can you hear me online, by the way? Okay. This is case 87 from the Blue Cliff Record, Human's Medicine and Disease. Human taught the assembly, saying, medicine and disease cure each other. The whole great earth is medicine. Which is the true self? Medicine and disease cure each other. Now, there's a koan for you. That's what Cohen's do. You think, you say, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, medicine's supposed to cure disease, but disease curing medicine? I don't know. See, we're so dualistic about these kind of things, especially medicine, wellness, healing, doctors. Aren't we? Look at the kind of words we use to fight cancer, war metaphors. We're fighting cancer. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is that we all have cancer in our body already. So, how come we don't all have cancer? So, is disease something that comes from outside? Uh, maybe it does in some situations, like the COVID virus. I don't think that's in our bodies. And if it is, then we're probably pretty sick. But think about, the, think about it this way. When we think about doctors and wellness and health. If you go to the doctor, and I, by the way, I've had several really good ones. Um, and you, you, you go to the doctor thinking the doctor's gonna fix you, then it's not gonna really be very effective. If you go to the doctor expecting to get a prescription to fix everything that's wrong with you, 
it's, it's going to be disappointing, or you're going to end up with a lot of prescriptions. And the pharmaceutical com companies make a lot of money off of us. It's a huge industry. People take so many pharmaceuticals that they, they have to take other ones to counteract the side effects of the ones they're already taking. You know, you've seen those ads, right, on TV, where they advertise something, and then, then and then they go on for like another minute and really fast talk. And and if you feel depressed or suicidal, see your consult your physician right away. And they go on and on like that for like a minute, and you think, holy moly, I'm I'm going to take that drug. So how how are we to think about being healthy. Isn't it kind of up to us? Now, definitely we want to go see doctors and specialists when we have a problem and uh, it's very useful, but if you're not proactive about your own health, then you're sort of a victim and you're sort of being you don't you've given up agency in your own well-being and you're expecting someone to fix you and doctors can't fix us that way can they <laughs> <laughs> The best thing doctors can be is, is kind, joyful. That's the healing medicine. So um, I recently went to my doctor, Dr. Newman at Rush, and I like him very well. He's really nice. And, uh, but I was complaining to him about my being overweight and I have been seeing these miracle drugs lately on, on the videos of YouTube and stuff, you know, promising that if you take this, you shoot up, I think it's like you shoot something in your arm and you lose weight, you know, and they make, you know, great promises. And I thought, this is it, this is the magic pill, you know, I, I'm, I can't lose weight. I, so I asked my doctor, I said, you know, I've been seeing all these things and I, I just want to know, you know, what, could you prescribe one of them for me? He said, yeah, I could, Robert, but it's going to cost you about $1,000 a month. And if you stop taking it in the future, you'll probably gain your weight back. I thought, well, that's not helpful. I was kind of pissed off, you know. I was expecting him to fix me. I was looking for that magic bullet. And then on top of it, because I was complaining a bit, you know, kind of going on. And I tell you, I've tried every fad, I've tried every diet, none of them work, you know. I'm tired of being overweight. I'm a little grumpy. I lose my breath when I walk up the stairs. So what's he do? He brings out the five wishes. He says, Robert, I think you probably should fill this out because you know, uh, your caregiver will be really happy when you fill this out because they'll know what your wishes are. And I, I'm thinking, he's given me the five wishes. But I said, I have, a, I have a will. He says, well, this is more than that. So I go home and I tell Ju Roshi June about it. She says, yeah, they gave that to my father when he was in hospice. And I'm thinking, what did what did Dr. Newman see in me that it cost him to bring to give me the five wishes? I say, do you think I'm going to be in hospice soon? You know, so I got a little worried, you know, because I'm trying to play the long game, you know, and I'm you know I'm getting older, so I'm thinking, oh no, this is not good, you know, this is not good. So um, I said to myself, I said. Oh, you know, I'm a Zen master. I should be able to lose weight. I should be able to use some discipline and mindfulness, you know. So, and I'm so sick of this. So I um, actually I did. I started. I used science and math. No fads. Just counting calories, and I started losing weight. 
felt pretty good. Then someone told me about the silver sneakers, you know, because we belong to that, because we're, if you're a senior here, and I don't know how it is in other parts of the country, but here, if you're a senior citizen, what is that, over, uh, over 65, you can belong to silver sneakers, and then silver sneakers has gyms associated with it. And you, I could, they had it, someone told me about this, I didn't realize it, and there was a gym, the Gottlieb uh, Health Fitness Center, which I can go to because it's part of the silver sneaker system and it's free. So I joined the gym. Not gonna lose weight at the gym, but I'll, I'll get healthier. So I started losing weight. I've lost about 20 pounds. Just counting calories. And then the, then, it, then the other thing that I realized was it's more than counting calories. It's actually eating good food. That actually is maybe more important than counting the calories because if you eat good food, maybe you don't need to eat so much or you don't need to need the comfort food. <clears throat> then um, June and me got COVID finally. We, this is the first time we had COVID and it really, uh, this, this variant is, um, it's, it's rough. It was really rough and um, so I, we, we both took Paxlovid, which you should take if you're older, at least. Uh, it'll help keep you out of the hospital. You, this, this stuff is unpredictable. You don't know where the COVID's going to take you from day to day. So we took, we took a five-day supply of the Paxlovid. And um, it's a nasty medicine. It leaves this metal taste in your mouth. And you, it's not the COVID that causes you to lose your taste. It's the Paxlovid. At least that was my experience. And that, the, the day I took Paxlovid, I put a cough syrup medicine in my mouth, thinking I'm going to suck on this sweet thing. I couldn't taste it. It was so weird. I have something in my mouth that I knew tasted sweet, but I couldn't taste the sweetness. And so I couldn't taste the food. It's not really much fun eating when you can't taste your food. So that was a good thing because I didn't eat as much. But then I had another kind of insight that if I can't taste the food, then maybe I should just eat nutritious food. It would be good for me because maybe eating isn't about the comfort food that I like. Maybe it's about actually nourishing my body. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a kind of another kind of aha moment when I couldn't taste the food. So it doesn't matter if I like it or not. I'll just eat the things that are good for me that I don't like. So I think we have a lot of duality around medicine and doctors and healing. And I think... Uh, I'm not going to tell you what human means by medicine, disease, cure each other, because it's a koan. But I think there's something in here about, I was sitting, we were sitting last night, I was in quite a bit of pain, and I found myself saying to all of you towards the end of the city, pain is medicine. Now, if you've done this practice for any length of time and, and you've ever had pain in your legs, some of you are pretty good shape, you might not, but most of you have probably, has anyone had some felt pain sitting Zazen? You haven't felt pain? <laughs> oh, that's a, you're in pretty good shape. Do you feel pain sitting? You, okay. So you, you get that, right? The pain, the pain is a kind of medicine that gets you here. We're all kind of, why are we here? We're all human beings and we have a kind of existential crisis of being alive, of dying. We're all confronted with a kind of existential thing here. And I think in many ways, that's why we're here. We're trying to figure out life and death. What is this all about? I'm not gonna be here forever. How could that be? So that's, isn't that a kind of disease? 
I mean, death. <laughs> That's the ultimate disease, you know. It's just, you're gone. You're not here anymore. I mean, what could be worse than that? And, and yet, if it weren't for life and death, we wouldn't be here doing this practice. So that gets you on the cushion. And then you figure out that it hurts. Your legs hurt, your back hurts, your stomach hurts, your head hurts. And if you resist it, it gets worse. And you figure this out intuitively that you have to go with it, right? You have to kind of be one with the pain. That makes no sense to anyone out there. But you know what I'm talking about when I say that, don't, don't you? You have to kind of go into it, let it be there. And, and then as your samadhi gets stronger, it actually shifts and changes and it's not as bad as it was, or it might be worse, but you're, it'll be worse. It'll definitely be worse if you struggle with it. If you start thinking about it a lot, and you, yeah, if you fight it, if you fight the pain, it'll be worse. So the pain kind of gets your attention. It gets you on your one seat and you stay here with that. You don't just get up and walk out of the Zendo. No, nobody did last night. You all stayed. Why? It was painful, but you stayed because you were also experiencing something in the meditation that was important and meaningful. And kind of extraordinary, actually, that you wouldn't experience otherwise, unless you were willing to have some pain in your legs, really. Nobody does this practice without pain. Pain is medicine. Medicine can be pain. Look at the op opioid crisis. People are in pain. They take opioids. Why wouldn't they? But if they take them and get addicted to them, then they have a new problem. Not the pain they have, but a new pain. Worse pain. Much worse. An addiction to opioids kills people. Turn people into hungry ghosts, animals. Lose their humanity. You know, in, um, in Chinese medicine, which I had the good fortune to study a little bit a couple years ago, they have two kinds of transformation. They call it the Hua transformation and the Bien transformation. <clears throat> and the Hua transformation is the positive transformation. That's the one we like. That's the one we want. But you can't have, according to the Chinese, because you know they're Taoists and they don't, they don't think in dualistic terms about this stuff. It's always another side to it. There's always the other side. And you can't have the Bien transformation, I mean the Hua transformation, without the Bien transformation, which is a disruption. You can't have the positive thing without the disruption that makes the positive thing possible. And who wants the disruption? <laughs> we're in the beginning of an AI revolution that's going to change we're not going to recognize our culture in five years we're going to be so different and the disruption that's going to take place is going to be so extreme and so painful a lot of people will lose jobs a lot of companies will go out of business everything's going to change and yet, that promises to actually solve global warming. But it will require such a huge disruption in our culture to, to do that. And there's no way to get there without the disruption. So if we survive the disruption and the political and the social 
blowback from the trans technological transformation doesn't take us down, we might actually solve global warming purely through technological AI disruption, disrupting technologies, which are all green. So I won't get started on this because I'll lose track of my Dharma talk. At Jun, Jun Roshi knows is I'm, I love this uh, technological stuff and I read about it all the time and I, it's the first time in my life I've felt hope about the environment. First time I've felt like there's actually hope for the future. So the other thing that comes up for me as I um, kind of sit with this koan is there's something about being with pain that is um, actually a wonderful part of our practice of bringing forth the compassion uh, within ourselves from our broken hearts, from our, from our own suffering from our own disappointments, from our own losses, comes this, um, what we call bodhicitta, this sad and tender heart, which is a place of great strength and the source of what we call taking, living by vow, living by the bodhisattva vow, which is really the essence of Zen practice, is to live by this vow. And I was, Thinking about this as, you know, we're now doing Oriyoki, and then we haven't done Oriyoki for about 10 years because I, I got tired of it. And we stopped doing it because I, I thought, you know, I got really secular and I said, come on, let's just eat like Americans, you know, we eat on plates and forks and, you know, so we did that for about 10 years. And then some of you start feeling left out. You, you kept telling me, don't you eat with Oriyoki and Zen? We've never eaten Oriyoki. We're never going to know what it's like, you know? And people, my students were telling me, we want to eat Oriyoki. <laughs> Why? It's just this ritual from medieval Japan. It's this Baroque thing. You really don't want to do it. But my students kept insisting that they did. So for the last couple of retreats, we've eaten the Oriyoki, and I've discovered I actually like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually amazing sitting at the table together, eating together, waiting for each other, it, and slowing down. It's just the most, and, and you know, the ambrosia, the water that tastes like ambrosia. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her face. <laughs> So I want to read the Milgatha for all of you to, because it's, it's basically, why are we eating? And it becomes apparent why we're eating when we do this ritual and we chant the Milgatha, and it's lovely. We're not just eating to survive. We're eating so we can fulfill our bodhisattva vow. That's why we're eating. That's amazing. It's beautiful. It's such a beautiful intention. It's such a different way to think. So here's how we start. <clears throat> Buddha was born at Kapilavatsu, enlightened at Magadha, and we chant it like this, taught at Paranasi, entered Nirvana at Kusinagara. Now I open Buddha Tathagata's eating bowls. Whose bowls are your bowls? The Tathagata's eating bowls. May I be relieved from self-clinging with all sentient beings. When people are ordained as priests or monks in the Buddhist tradition, one thing they get is the Oriyoki bowls, and that's maybe their most important possession. They will treasure those Buddha bowls for the rest of their lives. And you all have been using these Buddha bowls. They're not just bowls, they're Buddha Tathagata's bowls. And now, you know, chants in the midst of the three treasures, which are already here, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, in the midst of the three treasures and all sentient beings, all humans suffering, all kinds of suffering, unimaginable suffering going on in our world everywhere, 
in our own families, in our community, in our country, in our world, on the planet. Amidst all this suffering, suffering, let us recite the names of Buddha. Now, usually when we recite the names of Buddha, like we do it in uh, the Gate of Sweet Nectar, we're saying, vowing to be one with Buddha. So that's what we're doing here. When you recite the names of Buddha, you're being one with those names of Buddha, all of them. That's who you are. Or at least you're vowing to be that. So you should be careful what you vow, because it might come true. So here, we start. Pure Dharma Kaya Varochana Buddha. These are the three Kayas. The Dharma Kaya, the Samboka Kaya, and the Nirmana Kaya. And the, uh, the Dharma Kaya is the big, the big Buddha that's beyond size. You can't measure it. You can't calculate it. It's, it's, you can't conceptualize it. It's already here before we even think about it. This is the Dharmakaya Buddha. We are this Dharmakaya Buddha. Before we even, th we don't know it, we, don't, we can't understand it, we can't calculate it, measure it, conceptualize it. It's already here. Complete Sambhogakaya Buddha, Vairochana Buddha. This is the, what's called the dream body, the bliss body, the kind of in between, the limbic Buddha, in between this, the Dharmakaya and the embodied Buddha. We are all the Nirmanakaya Buddha. That's, the, that's Shakyamuni Buddha. That's you, me. We've been incarnated into these bodies. And as incarnated, Buddhas, Nirmanakaya Buddhas, we all have to, we all have these bodies that we take care of and that, that will suffer and they will eventually die and go away. Future Maitreya Buddha, it's a Buddha in the future, yet to come. You know, I feel really uh, a lot of gratitude and appreciation when we practice like this because I see you turning the Dharma wheel, learning how to carry on the Dharma but through this practice, each of you taking a position, learning how to do the services, practicing together. You are embodying the Dharma and you are carrying, you are, you are starting to carry it forward for the next generation. And our, our biggest responsibility is to not, we don't want this to die out, do you? Such a precious teaching as the Buddha Dharma, the three treasures. So it is our responsibility to make sure that we carry it on. And how are we gonna carry it on? Well, we have this wisdom tradition we've received. It's, it's, it's very precious. So we carry it on. It will change over hundreds of years. Of, maybe we won't recognize the forms that we're practicing in a couple hundred years. But we do the best we can to carry on what we've received from our teachers. So I'm really, I'm really grateful when, I, when, I, when I'm sitting here with you all and we're doing services, I feel, I feel hope. All Buddhas throughout space and time. You know, in a lot of the Mahayana Sutras, they have cosmic Buddhas, and they're, ever, they're, can, they're like all over the place. And we're being one with all of them. It's just like, you know, uncountable Buddhas and Bodhisattvas throughout all space and time. <clears throat> Mahayana Sadharma Pundarika Sutra. This is the Lotus Sutra, one of the most important Mahayana Sutras. It's all about bodhisattva vow, skillful means. Great Manju Sri Bodhisattva, wisdom bodhisattva, cuts, cuts, cuts through any kind of bullshit, confusion, delusion, afflictions, cuts. Cuts this and that, cuts any duality, cuts me and you, cuts any separation between me and other. Amazing. 
that's a two-sided sword. So it cuts, it cuts subject and object. There is no, that's a delusion that we're separate. It's a delusion that we see the world as objects. Mahayana Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. This is the Bodhisattva of practice. This is the Bodhisattva that gets on the cushion. That's you. Often, Samantabhadra is shown with Shakyamuni Buddha next to them. Or Manjusri, I'm sorry. So Manjusri is considered the wisdom Bodhisattva, and Samantabhadra is the one that puts it into action. That's the compassion side. That lives it. Goes out and does the work goes to work, raises a family, gets an education, goes out, turns a dharma wheel, helps others, practices, meditates. Great Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva of compassion, the one who hears the cries of the world the one who is able to hear the cries of the world, that does not look away from the cries of the world, that does not look away. Part of being a bodhisattva is that, you know, we acknowledge samsara as monumental, it's here, but we don't need to be um, afraid of samsara or to avoid it or to be taken down by it. We just accept that that's part of the world. There's this existential crisis that all people are facing and it's part of being a human being. And we're not particularly taken off our game because samsara is here. It's something to work with. Part of taking the vow as a bodhisattva is you meet any challenge as an opportunity to practice and learn more or to be more open, to open your heart. All bodhisattva mahasattvas. <laughs> I think it's covered most of the ground by now. Maha Prajna Paramita. That's the heart sutra we chant every morning, that beautiful sutra. It ends with a great supreme mantra. Gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhisvaha. Gone, gone, gone beyond, go beyond, going beyond, go beyond, going beyond, going beyond. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? Amen. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Preach it, brother. <clears throat> and then the Eno chants in the morning, this food comes from the efforts of all sentient beings. How does this food come to us? We should consider how the food comes to us. The migrants that pick the food for us, that we, we don't want to go out there and pick that food, that's hard work. The immigrants that pick the food for us, that we demonize in politics. Those people pick our food, they harvest it for us. The farmers that grew the food. The, the grocery, the people that brought the food and put it on the shelves so we could go to the store and buy it. The person slaving behind the counter that, that takes our money and has to put up with you know, rude people all day long. Service industry, that's a pits. They have to put up with rude people all the time. How does this food come to us? From the efforts of all sentient beings. Past and present. Its ten advantages give us physical and spiritual well-being and promote pure practice. Now, 
And then at lunch, instead of that, the Eno chants, we offer this meal of three virtues and six tastes to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and all, to all the life in the Dharma worlds. And then the Tenzo collects a food offering from each of us and puts it on the altar to, for the hungry ghosts. And we always wait and don't eat until the hungry ghosts are fed. It's part of our practice, right? We go last. Bodhisattvas go last. Vimalakirti said, as long as sentient beings are sick, I am sick. Bodhisattva vows to go last, not to actually achieve full, complete enlightenment until everyone is completely enlightened. <laughs> I have to wait a long time. And then we go through further. First 72 labors brought us this food. 72. Only 72. We should know how it comes to us. Second, as we, we receive this offering, we should consider whether we deserve it. Wow. Third, as we desire the natural order of mind to be free from clinging, we must be free from clinging and greed and attachment. Fourth, to support our life, we take this food. Fifth, to attain our way, we take this food. Oh, this is where the food offering is. All those of the Eno you know, chants, all those of the spiritual worlds, now I give you this offering. This food will pervade everywhere. You know, you don't know what kind of seeds you plant when you make an offering. You don't know how small or big it could be. It might seem very small, a small act of kindness, but you don't know what kind of seeds you plant when you do that, when you're kind to somebody. So bodhisattvas don't calculate how big or small their their generosity is. They just do their best to be of service to heal suffering in the world. First, this food is for the three treasures. Second is for our teachers, parents, nation, and all sentient beings. Our nation. It's for our country, too. You know, we can be kind of cynical about our country. but we shouldn't take it for granted what we have, the freedoms we have. Third is for all beings in the six worlds. The six worlds are the six worlds of suffering. Thus we eat this food with everyone. We eat to stop all evil, first pure precept, to practice good, the second pure precept, to accomplish to save all, to practice good, to save all sentient beings, to practice good for others. The third, pre -pre third pure precept, the three tenets. Not knowing, bearing witness, loving action. That's our practice. It's not complicated. Clear the decks. Stop making assumptions, judgments, opinions. Don't take, I mean, you can't stop doing that stuff, but don't take your, your, your opinions too seriously. <laughs> it's just your opinion, man, as June Roshi said the other day. Roshi, Roshi um, Bernie was very fond of saying, it's just my opinion, man. He was a great Zen master, too. So we start with not knowing. We start with humility. We start knowing that there's so much we don't know. 
we don't know what we don't know. And some gratitude that we can be here at all and have this open heart, willing to learn, willing to grow, willing to serve, and then we bear witness. We're willing to be with suffering without any resentment, without any attitude, but just be there with suffering, with our own, with each other's. That's the Bodhisattva vow. We don't feel like it's some kind of burden that we're doing this. We do it out of joy. We do it out of gratitude. We do it out of some confidence in our own sanity to be this big, to be this generous, to be this good. And then if you've practiced my phone is buzzing at me. <laughs> if we do the first two tenets, not knowing and bearing witness, and we do these more or less well with mindfulness, then we're in a position to then do something, to actually do good for others, because we're not overlaying our assumptions on the situation. We're kind of reading the field more accurately. So if you're reading the field more accurately, it's more likely that you can do something in that field. Somebody needs soup, you give them soup. You know what they need. They don't need a smile, they need soup. Or they need a job. Or they need, they need a smile. Or they need to be just held or hugged. Or acknowledged. What do people need? What does somebody need? You know that if you're present. And you're, you're not overlaying your assumptions on the situation. You can see what you can do and what you can't do. And you do what you can do. That's our bodhisattva vow. That is our practice. You develop as many <coughs> upayas as you can. So you're like Avalokitesvara with a thousand arms and in each hand there's a tool. So you, you collect tools for your toolbox to save sentient beings with. You're like a carpenter. <laughs> you have a toolbox and you have, you know, in your toolbox you have meditation, you have Cohen study, you have nonviolent communication, you have grace. What else do you have in there? Reading, hula, what, what else? Hmm? Listening. Listening, dancing, yoga, exercising, walking, Huh? Cooking. Cooking. <laughs> yeah. Humor. How does this food come to us? Humor. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Boy, what, how would we be without humor? That would be grim. Really grim. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Yeah, humor will get us through the day. May we exist in muddy water with purity like a lotus. Thus we bow to Buddha. May we be in the muddy water. May we be with suffering and not look away and be of service. Be kind. Help others. It's the it's way to have joy. Not just happiness, but joy. Joy is more sustainable. Oetsu. Dharma joy. <laughs> Okay, so I don't think I have anything more to say. I mean, I could say more, but that's enough. So any, any thoughts or questions? There's another microphone here.
Anybody? Online? In the Buddha Hall? Yeah. <laughs> you spent your whole life. <laughs> Medicine and disease. I, I have three thoughts. One is I, I think that koan makes total sense. What? I think that koan makes total sense. Uh -huh. Because I think... Speak louder. Okay. I'll sit up and speak oh, yeah. louder. Because yeah. um, I think disease teaches us a lot about medicine. And as people teach us what their disease is about, and we see how it responds to medicine, we can modify the medicine uh -huh. so that it's less toxic, has less side effects. Yes. Or maybe there's something else we can do that you don't even need the medicine anymore. Uh -huh. So disease does cure yeah. the rotten parts of medicine. Uh huh. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So isn't that, and in fact, isn't that when you have a uh, antibody, when you receive a vaccine, you're actually getting a small piece of the disease in the body so the immune system can get activated to... to yeah, sometimes you're getting sometimes. a particle to have your body create the antibody, and sometimes you're just getting the antibodies, so depending on that. Yeah. And then my second thought was when you, when you were having pain last night, <laughs> I got worried about you, so I was I was meditating. You're so sweet. And then I started like the whole like cardiac protocol in my head <laughs> when you started doing this with your left shoulder. You wanted to come help me. So that's why, yeah, I went. <laughs> so my meditation stopped, and, <laughs> and my brain started. Thinking, thinking way too, thinking way too hard and way too much worry for you. So I just had to check on you, and then I was debating on checking on you sooner because I was like, well, if it is this hard, we have twenty minutes. And we <laughs> so that's where my brain went. Um, but there's there's a new saying that the medical students are using. When I went to teach yesterday, they say that they do their meds daily, and M is for meditation, E is for exercise, D is for diet. And S is for sleep. Uh huh. Meds. They love. They love. You know, Good. mnemonics. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Roshi. Um, it's really um, timing for me. You know, I'm type two diabetic, and um, I've been in denial about that for about twenty two years. And. Um, at some point, a doctor had said to me, um, you know, is it going to take an amputation for you to do the right thing? And um, those words were profound at the moment, but, you know, it didn't keep me away from the Pop-Tarts, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately. Um, but recently, about a month or so ago, um, I'm sure it's the practice and the way that life is, you know, universe is, is showing up. Um, I didn't have to be in so much pain to make a decision to love my body and to take care of it, mm -hmm. which was a really nice thing because it was less threatening. It felt like it was going to continue because I really wanted this, uh -huh. you know, just um, the practice of kind of falling in love with myself and, mm -hmm. and the embodiment and meditation where you were talking about pain. And I started to pay attention to my pancreas. Like I was trying to find it when I was uh -huh. breathing. Uh -huh. You know, and I was like, hello, pancreas. You know, mm -hmm. sorry I've been so neglectful. Yeah. You know, I've been angry at it uh -huh. for, you know, not letting me have a whole, you know, Pop-Tart without feeling sick. Yeah. I mean, it really, it's been this yeah. battle. Yeah. Um, so when you started to talk about these war terms, yeah, I feel like there was a lot of war terms between me and my body and my organs. You know, like, yeah, why are you doing this to me? I don't deserve this. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate your talk. And the other thing I want to say is that, and I've changed my eating. I'm eating according to a diabetic nutrition. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm working on kind of the addictive part that wants me to graze for comfort, mm -hmm. you know, from family yeah. of origin. It feels really good. I feel really good about being able to be a bodhisattva longer. Because if I'm alive longer, then I can be a bodhisattva longer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that when you, um, when you, when you, you in particular said, I have hope about global warming, um, it brought me to tears because I have 
I have witnessed you and showed just with so much heartache about dark times and about the earth and about, mm -hmm. you know, just wish that people would love on each other, you know, and I think about um, both you Roshis, like how much you've done in your life, you know, towards that, like purposely from gardening to moving to places to, you know, helping people have vows. And I'm just, when, when you said that you had hope, um, it really moved me. Um, and I was just so happy for you, Roshi, <laughs> that I really was. I just was like, you know, what a wonderful thing that you can say that and feel that, you know, because we have been through a lot of dark times the last few years. We have. And um, so I just thank you for that nugget and uh, for that vulnerability, um, because I felt it really deeply. I'm really grateful. Um, I'm really grateful for everybody here. I'm, I'm really grateful that this saga has helped me get healthier and enjoy living. So I really am grateful. Thanks. There's another thing that uh, he says here in the Cohen, the whole great earth is medicine. It's a wonderful thing. I was out walking the other day and someone, it was a sun, the sun was out. Some, I was at, I like to go to Limburg Park which is all indigenous plants. And someone was lying on the grass like this. <laughs> I said, that person gets it. I mean, he lied on their back, you know, just taken in the sun. I'm thinking, well, wow, that looks nice. You know, the whole great earth is medicine. I'm glad, I love this, Teisho. Um I'm glad you, you tied in, because my first question was gonna be, what, what did, how does what you said last night impact? And you went there first, so. Um, but the idea of weight loss, for me, um, I grew up, I was a very overweight kid, um, fought it, okay? When I went to college, I rode lightweight, why? Because I could develop a healthy eating disorder to make weight with the team. Right. Mm -hmm. um, then as I got older, I realized that I was loathing how I was being and I had put on so much weight. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, it was a comedian who kind of triggered it. There, there's a comedian who's been around for years called Dana Gould. And he talked about and I stole his joke, so I'm crediting it. Uh, he talks about an app that he used to help him lose weight, which is called Drop the Fork Fat Ass. Um, <laughs> and I literally will repeat it to myself, like, but now in a loving way. Like, but, you have, but that part of it, you have to love yourself in order to do it. You cannot do it from a place of, of anger or disdain or, um, uh, or fighting it. Yeah. Okay? It has to start with, and, and the pain that triggered it all was my rock bottom, okay? Yeah. In marriage, work, everything. Yeah. And, and realizing that the pain from my rock bottom allowed me to learn to love myself and get back here, it truly is medicine from that perspective. Yeah. So for that, you know, I am so grateful. Yeah, so there's a lot of pain is subjective. Not all, there's physical pains too, but you know, people often have back aches and they think it's physical where it might just be the way they're feeling about the world. They feel insecure about their job. Or something. And we used to do this practice a lot called focusing. <clears throat> we don't do it anymore explicitly here, but one of the things in focusing is you go to the place in your body where the pain is and you start by welcoming it. You say hello to it. It's a very different approach, right? You're being friendly with your body. It's, there's a whole Tibetan practice that I've talked about before about feeding your demon. It's a whole different approach to well-being as you think of what does the demon want? And, and when I did this practice, my demon was pretty, um, uh, I must, it's a little embarrassing to say, but my demon was pretty uh, vital. <laughs> he had a lot of energy. And, and you know, someone asked me what he wanted. I said, he wanted everything. I mean, he wanted everything. And I did this practice at the begin, beginning of the pandemic, and I gave him, it's a specific Tibetan practice that I did, and you put yourself in his seat, and you be him, and I 
I gave him all that he wanted. And I kept, he wanted a lot. It took a while to feed him. When I hit, when he was full, he disappeared. And in his place came this, the most extraordinary archetypal white Tara-like, better than Tara, that, that uh, was as real as my hand. And uh, she emerged and she gave me everything. She took everything. And, and she took, she got me through the pandemic. And so the, it's a very different approach, huh? That you actually feed the thing or you approach the thing that you're afraid of, the disease, the pain, and you, you say hello to it. And we had this experience a lot doing focusing back in the day when we were doing it, where I would do it with people and someone would have like a really bad pain in their back. And you don't think of going to be with the, to be with the pain, you think of pushing it away. That's what we do. But if you go and occupy the felt sense of that in the body, it often goes away. I've seen this happen a lot with people, not always. I mean, there, but um, it's just counterintuitive. It's a very different way of thinking about pain and wellness. You don't have to fight the, you don't have to use the war metaphors to, to fight and overcome it. You could be with it in a way that could be much more helpful. Yeah, and you know, more friendly, more user friendly. <laughs> Be user friendly <laughs> with yourself. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Well, there are there are medicine is useful and right medicine for the right you know, thing is why we go to doctors is to, to get a prescription that we need. And um, I'm not, would never imply that we shouldn't see doctors or um, have prescriptions when we need them. Um, uh, but I think in general, our culture over, over uh, depends on prescriptions uh, and uh, people take probably more than they need some of the time. Anyway, just a different change of attitude. Not, we don't need to fix ourselves in that way. <laughs> Besides for um, going from fighting to working with your disease, there's also a, a new movement for what we call de-prescribing. What? De-prescribing. De-prescribing. So there's all lectures and everything on how to just sit with your patient and be like, do you really need this medicine? Do you really need this medicine to try to pull people off? Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you do that? Oh, I used to do that all the time. Uh, I'm a minimalist. You never did it with me. <laughs> <laughs> Roshi, I have a question. Uh, you know, having studied a lot of to, to, that got me to Zen was mythology and, you know, how religion is really mythology and, and how there is no true modern American mythology, okay? There is no, you know, but mythology in general is a pedagogy. Oh, yeah, John Wayne. We have, which is, yeah, and the Marlboro Man, which, which are two of the most unhealthy icons you could have, right? Swallow it all, be silent, smoke cigarettes, ride a horse, and die of lung cancer. Super. But, but the idea really, I think, with Zen and how it ties in is a pedagogy is a way to train children. And most of the modern mythologies, okay, the, particularly the religious ones, do not address what happens when you grow up, what happens once you are an adult, which keeps us in this childlike state of mommy or daddy doctor fix me, make me better, versus what can I do and, I, and, and this is part of what, and Jung would call it individuation or maturation, but that for me is what Zen has been providing, is this how to be, as my two sons would call it, and they'd say it from when they were 10 years old, Dad, you can't tell me what to do. I'm a grown-ass man. It's like, mm -hmm. no, you're not. But the idea is, how do you get there? 
And, and for me, Zen is a path to say, how do I finally get to be at age 61 a grown ass man and, and take my own agency? Well, I suppose Zen practice is appropriate for whatever age you happen to be. I mean, if you're a teenager, it's one kind of practice. If you're a 20 year old, yeah, and we have to eventually let go of the chip on our shoulder because we all feel like we've suffered and the world owes us something and it doesn't owe us anything. So you get past that. There are mythologies for midlife, there are mythologies and stories for midlife crisis. They're specifically for midlife. There are a whole series of them. Yeah. Yeah, we all have to grow up. Yeah. We have to grow up and, and uh, it's a kind of a paradox that we need to have agency. And at the same time, if we have too much willpower it gets in the way. So there's a part of practice is letting go of agency, and but at the same time we need it. So just like Zen, it's a paradox. You know, the other thing I'll say about the environment is that um, I've had a lot of despair about it in my life, and I don't, I've come to the point where I don't think the despair is very useful. I just don't think it's helpful. In fact, I think it's kind of selfish. And I think, um, I don't think we can afford to have despair anymore. We need to figure things out and we need to take care of the planet. And um, Just being angry and, um, you know, I, there are environmental groups that do things that I don't understand anymore. They, they burn things and they destroy things because they're against capitalism. I just don't understand that. Uh, I just don't understand a lot of the really far left practices when it comes to the environment. I think we're living in a, just an extraordinary time. And one of the reasons I hope to live a long time is to fulfill my bodhisattva vows and see how it turns out, you know, because <laughs> we're at just the beginning of a revolution like nothing we've ever seen. It is going to be, um, talk about a ride. It's going to be a journey. And um, if we can just uh, hang in there, it'll be fun to see how it turns out. Okay, maybe that's enough for, for today. So time for uh, lunch. Okay, thank you. Bison, part of the job when you bring tea is to pick it up at the end. Too. Yeah, thank you. Are you done with it? Yeah.